Can you hear that? Yes. What's up, Pastor Rafe? Hey, Joel. Good to see you. Welcome to the Think Podcast Worldview Wednesdays with Joel and Pastor Rafe. I'm Joel. And I'm Pastor Rafe. And we are talking today about a very serious subject, one that, uh, quite honestly, Rafe, I think you'll join me in saying that this is well overdue, especially considering it's the two of us. Yes. <laughs> uh, we, this is, we, this is it's certainly a topic you and I have talked about uh, more than a handful of times. This has been yes. a driving conversation for a lot of our conversations, Joel. Yes, it has. Yes, it has. So we're talking, it's Worldview Wednesday, and this is the episode, the day of the week, when Rafe and I tackle a, um, a current event and we analyze it through a worldview lens, the biblical worldview lens. And sometimes what we have the opportunity to do is we have the opportunity, we have the chance to look at a broader worldview issue through the lens of a particular current event. And that's really what we're going to be doing today. Um, before we get started, though, Rafe, your scenery looks a little different. <laughs> You're, uh, where, <laughs> where am I? Where are you right now? Uh, so my, I'm at my brother-in-law's place. My brother-in-law set up a, has a out where I was had terrible internet connection. Hence, last week where you and I were playing with a delay on how we were talking to each other. Mm-hmm. So I drove down uh, down the street a bit and I'm using my brother-in-law's setup where he's at, and he's got a good. He's got like a whole studio built out here where I have a good camera. I got a good microphone and uh, a cool orange light behind me. That is pretty epic, man. And. Hey. Uh, I heard, I, you were telling me something off screen. You said uh, he built an axe throwing range. W- what's up with that? <laughs> he did. Yeah. So I, I don't know if he can hear me on the other side of the door right now. I'm going to brag about him. But he built an epic axe throwing range that uh, I love that man very much. And he, uh, we had a fun time last week. I, got, I showed up at the very end and got to help kind of put the finishing touches on it. But uh, got to throw some axes out in the front yard a couple, a couple days ago. Wow. Pretty cool. It was fun. That's that, that's very cool. So who's a better extra? Uh oh boy. I can I can I can I no, it was him. It was certainly him. Was it? Yeah, for sure. He got that's more throws than me. That's good. Um so uh good to know that axe throwing is still deemed essential here in uh oh no, you're not in Illinois, are you right now? I'm I'm just over the border. Just over the border. Just for a just for a day. Did I just nerd? No, well, not just for a day, just for a short bit of time. Did I just uh did I just out you right now? Is it's okay. It's okay. Lori Lightfoot's going to come come a knocking. I thought I heard her knocking at the door <laughs> yesterday. Uh, no, just kidding. Um, so, what, what, uh, dude, can you can you just introduce this topic? What we're what we're getting into? I I actually I'm still yeah. a little bit shaken up. I Alisa and I, my wife and I, just before we started filming. Uh, we started watching this video, which I hope to be able to play at the end of our recording mm-hmm. today, so we can respond to it. But it literally had me in tears. Uh, this yeah. is a, this is a subject that's very emotional for me. Um, I know it's one that obviously you've given a lot of thought to. You and I have have done a little bit of uh, you might call what you might call prayer activism. Mm-hmm. Um, but but w- what are we talking about today, and why does this matter? Yeah, well, I, I'm glad you give me a chance here and maybe set us up a little bit because I think whenever you talk about this topic. Um, there's so many things you want to say as a preface before you jump in and you can never say it all. And so I'm going to give a, a, a little bit of a preface here that I think will help set us up for a lot of the things we have to talk about. Um, so remember, I'm a pastor, uh, but before I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian. Uh, and what that means is, is that I, I'm, I'm thinking through the world through a biblical lens. I want to hold my Bible open and I want to interpret reality. I want to interpret everything I see based on scripture. And uh, that includes everything that happens around us in in life, and particularly when it comes to issues of abortion. Uh, the Bible has a lot to say. And as a bit of a preface, I, I think, you know, uh, I, I, I preached a sermon probably close to a year ago, where I, no, a little less than a year ago, where I really tackled abortion head on. And uh, it's interesting, when, when you talk about this topic in the church, um, a lot of people get uncomfortable very fast. And that's okay. Uh, I, I understand that. I know how we got to the place we're in, where that's very uncomfortable to talk about, because it is an uncomfortable topic. It's a really, it's, we're talking about the, the death of babies, and there's no easy way to talk about it other than head on. But as we talk about it, there, there's something that I think, as a Christian brother, I want to say, uh, to those that are upset that we're talking about this, 
is that I want to challenge people to really consider what we're going to be talking about from the lens of scripture. Much of the modern church has been shaped by the news they hear, by the voices they hear in the, in, in society. And we're, we're, if, if you don't realize that we're constantly being bombarded by anti-Christian messages of how to interpret reality, abortion is one of the easiest places to see that. It's just a completely anti-Christian thing to do. And yet it's considered almost, a, I mean, frankly, it's celebrated in the world today. But I, not only that, I also want to come at this as, as a way of preface by saying, I know that some of the folks who are going to listen either now or later on to this either have had an abortion or maybe even are considering an abortion right now. And I think some of the folks that get into that place where they're considering an abortion, many of them are coming from a deep place of brokenness. And I I think very few people, this is an easy decision. I think that does happen. But I think many are coming from a very broken place. And before we even jump into the hard stuff of abortion, I, I just want to make sure my voice as a Christian brother, as a pastor is heard to say that that literally where there is brokenness, whatever abuse, whatever bad decisions, whatever things that there is fear about, I'm an adoptive parent, right? Like, like whatever things that there are fear about in your life of what might happen in your future, I want you to know that the church, Christianity wants to come around you in your brokenness and Jesus can heal what has been broken. He can He can heal you. And so I want you to know that the first voice, if that's you listening to this and you're scared or that's you and you've had an abortion, you're wondering what judgment's gonna come. The Bible does have a lot to say with clarity and we need to talk about that. But I also want you to hear a message that Jesus offers both forgiveness for sin, but also full healing and restoration. He sets your heart on a new path where you see his law as the primary aim of your life. And if that's you right now, by way of preface, I want to say, please hear that Jesus has so much to offer you. And I hope that you'll turn to him. And I hope that gives you a bit of a... um, a safe place to engage with us if you're sitting on an opposite camp from where Joel and I are going to be right now, uh, trying to think through this issue from a biblical perspective. Man, I really, really appreciate that, Rafe. Um, you know, I've always appreciated your pastoral method of talking about issues like this and, and this issue in particular. I listened to the sermon that you preached at uh, Park South Loop. It must have been probably two years ago now, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe it was older. Yeah, two years. Yeah. And, you know, I, I appreciated the way you handled it with, with grace. Um, sometimes we can get so fired up about an issue and right. quite, quite honestly, an issue like this, rightly so. Rightly so. <clears throat> but we can forget that there's another human being made in the image of God on the other side of this discussion. And quite honestly, we don't know what's going on and what burdens that person is carrying. Right. And so we need to, uh, I, I appreciate the way you use, use the word brokenness. Um, I think we need to be able to use words like that. We need to use categories of right and wrong, right? categories of sin and righteousness as Christians, categories of truth and error. But we also need to be able to speak the truth in a loving way, which doesn't mean watering down the truth. Right. Because if my kid is wa- is running towards the street or riding towards the, the street when there's a car coming, you know, it's not going to be loving of me to go, now, now, little junior please stop. Consider stopping. Oh, I pray that you would, you say, stop, right. Stop it now. Right. Yeah. Right. That's as, the most loving thing I can do. Right. As, as Cornelius Van Til, one of our heroes used to, used to say, you want to create a head on collision with, with wrong and with bad thinking and with yes. illogical ways of going, you don't want to come alongside someone going the wrong direction and just kind of gently try to maneuver. You want to just say, wait a second, let's talk about the biblical worldview. Let's, let's create that collision and actually allow place to wrestle through. What does the Bible say? I'm with you. Yeah, no, that's good. And as long as we're we're uh, name dropping some of our favorite authors, uh, let me just throw Francis Schaefer into the mix here because there's a good reason why this conversation that we're about to have, Rafe, is going to seem foreign, abrasive, and uh, unnecessarily controversial to many who are going to watch it. And that's because many in our society have fallen below what's called the line of despair which mm. is uh, what Francis Schaefer talks about. And I just, I was listening to some other podcast recently where they were talking about this and I love the Francis Schaefer reference, but Schaefer talks about this line of despair that has worked its way through the institutions in Western society. And Schaefer was, uh, he was an American, but he lived in Switzerland and our, our um, society has slipped below the line of despair in every area, which, which means that we don't believe there's objective we don't believe that there's objective 
value to life, mm -hmm. that there is a, a transcendent hope that supersedes um, uh, that, that supersedes my circumstances, right? We don't believe that there's a meaning that is ascribed to our lives. We believe we have to create our own meaning. You know, the, the gospel of Disney, follow your heart. Right. And, and so because of that, today we're going to talk about some objective objectivity. We're going to talk about some absolute moral values, and we're going to apply those moral values to the situation here in Illinois. Um, and that's going to seem like, like sandpaper to some people. That's going to sound like nails on the chalkboard. And so I just have to acknowledge this up front that being loving doesn't, we're not going to sugarcoat it for anybody because we believe that people can handle the truth. But right. at the same time, we are, we are going to be as Christ-like as possible and, and not just try to you know, stir the pot just so that we get, uh, you know, people's uh, cockles up or, right. or uh, whatever the expression is. <laughs> I don't know if that's the expression, but, <laughs> but I'll, but cockles, I appreciate cackles, something. Yeah, you know, you know, what's so important. Anytime Christians talk about this topic, you got to go back to scripture and, and, you know, uh, the verse that just says, you know, it's listing off all these vices and, and sins that people fall into. And then it says, and such were some of you. Uh, but you were saved, you were washed, you were cleansed. And I think the gospel always, first and foremost, looks uh, into the inner, in, into yourself. It, it finds the sin inside. It understands what Jesus has done for a wretch like me. And then with that worldview, right, with the perspective of a wretch like me, we can speak into brokenness in the world and speak into other people's lives, not as like a, like a, like a top down, I'm better than you, as a, I, such, such were some of me. Like I, I've been saved from my own list of vices and sin, and I'm speaking as a sinner to a sinner. Can we please talk about objective truth and the love of Christ? He is the only one that saves from this. But we got to go to Christ, and we got to recognize that He has objective truth, objective law, and He does speak into every aspect of society and every aspect of morality. Yeah, and that includes government, and that's why today, respectfully, we're going to address our target today. Uh, not that we want to take him out. In fact, we'd love to see him thrive and uh, and uh, rule righteously. We'd love to see him um, adapt a biblical worldview. But of course, our, our target for the purpose of this conversation is Governor J.B. Pritzker, the governor of Illinois. And there's a particular reason why we're calling him out. It's not because... It's not because we are envious of his power or his responsibility, because quite frankly, I don't know that either one of us would, would take that job uh, if it were offered to us. Um, I know I wouldn't. <laughs> you know what, Rafe? I would vote for you, dude. I would. I'd have I, one, you and my mom. <laughs> I, uh, yes, that's right. So um, um, I could probably convince uh, my kids to vote for you as well. And since we live in Chicago, that probably would we'd probably uh, no find a way to work that out. Um, I've got a few uh, relatives who have passed on who could probably vote for you as well. Vote early, vote often is the Chicago way, my friend. So um, is that too far? Rafe, you got to pull me back. You're going, you're, you're going. You're going. I don't know where you're going, Joel. You got to. You got to rein me in, man. All right. So here's the here's the three the three lenses we want to look at uh, this issue of abortion and Governor Pritzker and the Bible through today. And let me just put up that that banner here. Um, we're talking about abortion, the Bible, and Governor Pritzker. And what I'm hoping we can address is the governor's blatant hypocrisy uh, in, a, in a recent situation, the Bible's helpful guidance. We're going to look at this from a biblical worldview. That's what we do. And then what is the Christian's proper response? And in saying this, we're not passing down laws from on high. We're not Moses ascending Mount Sinai and staring in the face of God. But what we want to do is we want to apply the biblical principles we're going to look at to the real world situation in which you may find yourself and offer you some guidance and some advice as a couple of thinkers, as a pastor and a missionary who um, who deal with this sort of thing. But it's ultimately going to be up to each individual Christian to follow their spirit guided, their Holy Spirit guided conscience under the authority of scripture to figure out how they're going to respond to this um, uh, in real time. Would you agree with that? hundred percent. Yeah. No, I love the agenda for the day. I think this is uh, what I hope people are hearing is that the biblical worldview informs every day. I, who was it? Was it Spurgeon used to say every morning you got to wake up and you got to have the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other? I think that was Billy Graham. Was it Billy Graham? Or did he steal it from Spurgeon? He might have stolen it from Moody, actually, now that I think. Oh, okay, there you go. Well, we'll give it to one of those greats. Uh, but it's it's true. And so I think this is a today it's a today issue that continues to be an issue. And um, 
And, you know, I think thinking of Pritzker, Joel, you, you made a comment earlier and we talked about this before, but you and I, uh, shortly after uh, Pritzker was made governor, one of the first things he did was he made Illinois, uh, if not the most close to the, the most abortion friendly state in uh, the country. That was his language, what he wanted to do. Um, and you and I were there uh, as prayer, uh, a prayer defense uh, to pray for Pritzker, to pray that uh, this would end, that he would change his mind. Uh, of course, it didn't. The law got signed in into the state of Illinois, but we were there on the signing of that day uh, and we were praying and we were asked to leave the room where we were. We were asked to kind of go out into the hallway and then they closed the door on us uh, and they weren't happy. But that's that, that I think that that there is a Christian response to evil. Uh, and the Christian response is not to not talk about it. It's not to be passive. It's to pray, to trust the Holy Spirit, and to step in and see the kingdom of God go forward. Because we really believe Jesus wins. <laughs> we, we actually know that Jesus has written the story and his, he's going to win. And so we believe we're on the winning side of history. Yeah, the Bible says most of the enemies of Christ will be placed under his feet. Most of those enemies will. And we're hoping that a, abortion is one of those en- Wait, is that right? Most of the enemies? Is that- <laughs> all. All of all the enemies. Go, all. All. And, uh, and, they, and abortion is one of those enemies. So, so jump in hope- for it, Joel. What, your, your first topping, talking point is the governor's blatant hypocrisy. Well, so, so uh, walk us through. Where are you seeing this hypocrisy? All right. So National Review is reporting. This is from a week ago. This is on the 14th. So it's a little old news, but um, it's still very relevant today in light of something that Pritzker just came out and did today. So according to the National Review, Illinois Governor Democrat J.B. Pritzker remains adamant that he will not begin to lift the lockdown he has imposed in his state or consider a phased reopening that loosens restrictions in less affected areas. Um, This is a week ago. He's since doubled down on this. Um, with, I think, a couple of caveats. I'm going to get to that in a second. But the story continues. Rafe, listen to this, man. But yesterday, Pritzker warned that he will crack down on any business. Oh, no, no, no. That's not right. No, no. Next paragraph. Here we go. Meanwhile, in Waukegan, Illinois, less than an hour north of the heart of Chicago, Planned Parenthood has just opened a brand new abortion clinic, one of about 20 in the state. According to Illinois Right to Life, Planned Parenthood, get this, used shell company names on its license applications so no one would be aware that an abortion clinic was opening in the area until it had been approved. Rafe, this reminds me of the verse that says that those who are going to do evil love darkness and they hate the light. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's shocking. I mean, just to read that statement, and I, I, I have to do more research to understand that, but assuming that that's true, mm-hmm. that they used shell company names to get it open because they knew what would happen if they were just blatant about it uh, and, and clear, that's, um, that is the enemy's tactics. Satan does not play fair. He doesn't play by the rules. Scripture calls him a liar. Scripture calls him an accuser. And when you have an organization that is... Uh, literally has made it their aim to have abortion to to literally that's what they they say they're for they're for abortion while they have some kind of public message where they try to say that they're not for that that's not the main thing they yeah do. it's only three percent of their business only three percent that's not true that is not a true statement uh it's the majority of their money making and it's the main thing they push both in what they physically do as well as politically what they do and what they lobby for right. it's about abortion that's planned right. parenthood well, right. And you remember, um, I don't know, a year or two ago when President Trump said he would continue giving them tax dollars if they would just get rid of abortion. After all, it's only 3% of what they do. And you would think that that would be an easy thing to uh, to to eschew. Es- but they didn't do it, of course, because abortion is a lot more than 3%. It's the whole driving uh, sacrament of their, uh, if we want to call it a religion, that's that's their communion. That's, yeah. their, that's their ritual. Yeah. Um, well, now, why is this hypocritical? That was that was a snarky. <laughs> it was a good and snarky move on Trump's behalf. He, I mean, it was uh, it was good and snarky in the sense of he did it because he wanted to make a point. Well, right. He right. knew full well they would not they would not take that because right. uh, from their worldview, why would they? Right. Uh, however, uh, it was it made its point very clear. Yeah, absolutely right. So the reason why this the reason why this new opening in Waukegan of this abortion mill is is controversial. Um, look. They knew they were going to get opposition. They knew they were going to get protests. Why? 
Well, first of all, they're opening up a facility that is the, the, the purpose of it being there is to provide abortion care. Or yeah. as those of us with um, uh, a, a knowledge of uh, scripture and science and sociology like to say, murder of the unborn. Right. And um, so that's why they're there. And the reason why this is especially hypocritical on the part of Governor Pritzker, and I say this out of all biblical respect and submission to his office, it's hypocritical because Pritzker is cracking down on so-called non-essential businesses right now. Churches cannot open in Illinois, even though some are defying that rule. Um, Quote unquote, non-essential businesses cannot open. And even with a phased opening, even even with a uh, a geographically sectored um, uh, situation in Illinois, which he has he has his plan does address or does allow for, churches can't open and many businesses still can't open for the sole purpose, according to Governor Pritzker, of saving lives, of keeping people healthy. And then he goes and allows a a clinic. And I, I don't even want to call it a clinic. That's why I call it a mill. I, don't, I knew a guy who used to call them abortion chambers. Mm. Uh, and he, he's opening this facility, this mill, where the where babies are going to be. Um, listen, I don't know that we want to describe the process of an abortion right now, because quite honestly, my kids are going to listen to this, Rafe. Yeah. But, well, it would be helpful. Well, while maybe not describing it word for word right now, there are a couple helpful videos that I've watched and I've posted uh, of doctors, particularly, I can think of a couple doctors in specific who have gone and very clearly described what takes mm-hmm. place in a in a second term abortion, uh, and that is helpful for people to hear and to know, so that they're un- they're aware of what we're talking about. Because um, I think that you know, I would also add one other thing. It, it's hypocritical in that sense, uh, in terms of um, wanting to save lives. It's also what I would say it's hypocritical in another sense, in that. Uh, One of Pritzker's main lines of argument right now, and again, we've already talked about Pritzker and the whole shutdown, and we tried to give him the respect and and understanding he's in a tough spot. He's, you know, with respect to him, I think he's trying to lead out of his worldview. I don't think he's trying to maliciously hurt anybody. Um, I hope not. But he claims everything he's doing is rooted in science. (laughs) That's his whole thing. Now, it's actually... I, w- I would say it's not, it's not, but his whole thing is let's let the science lead. That's his, that's his language. And when it comes to every issue, <laughs> we're Christians are for that. We were, we are good with science. We don't think it's the, uh, we don't think it's like literally the only thing. It can't dictate morality, but when it comes to abortion, uh, the science is very clear. Mm-hmm. Uh, the science, we have so much science. You literally have a, you, you can take a, what is it, a 3D ultrasound now and literally go in and look at the child's face and eyeballs and no, uh, you can, if I, if my wife was pregnant right now, I could go in and I could, I could look at the similarities of my child's facial features to my facial features or to my wife's facial features and see it. And we, the, the science is not confused on what is taking place in the, the body of a woman who's pregnant. Not at all. And so the second area where it's hypocritical is that there is nothing scientific about the abortion industry right. whatsoever. Right. It is so easily debunked. Uh, it's not even funny, but it doesn't, it's not often talked about. And it's, it's pervade as if it's the opposite, as if science is on the other camp, but it's yeah. not. Well, and this is, this is where um, the, the biblical worldview is so helpful, Rafe, is because, the, and this is why as Christians, we don't simply appeal to science. Now, Like you said, we love science. We believe in science. Uh, The scientific revolution, I talk about this all the time. The scientific revolution was started by Christians Christians. operating from a Christian worldview. And that was not a coincidence, despite the claims of some. Um, So we love science, but we don't merely appeal to science. Here's why. Because simply to say that the the child in the womb, the unborn, pre-born child, is a human being. That only takes you so far. because, Because what you have to say next is, it's an un. It's it's a human being with the uh, who has not forfeit with the right to life, who has not forfeited his right to life. Okay, and then you have to say something after that. You have to say, and the murder of a person or the killing of a person like that is rightly called murder. And then after that, Rafe, what you have to say is, and murder is wrong. 
Now, the reason why you have to take all these steps, which may seem unnecessary, is because in the last couple of years, you have had opinion pieces being written by those on the other side who say, yes, abortion takes a life, but it's a life worth taking. Or yes, abortion is murder, but it's it's a murder worth committing. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, maybe we need to add one more, you know, piece on there that says, and murder will be judged by God or something. But operating from within a biblical worldview, we we get all of that. We don't need to artificially chop up our worldview and say, yes, it's murder. We get that. Or yes, it's the killing of an, uh, it's the unjust killing of a human being, but we don't have to add that caveat. We can take it all the way through to its logical conclusion, which coincidentally, or really not so coincidentally also agrees with that inner sense, that moral sense that we have that, that a, a child should not be unjustly killed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you know, there's a reason why if you put up a sign at an abortion mill, of the product of an abortion and you show what comes out of an abortion, the, the dismembered, disfigured little human being. There's a reason why that is so repulsive to people. Right. Because it strikes a chord deep in our moral soul. Right. We know that what we're looking at is the image of God and that it's wrong. Yeah. There's a, I, I'm looking at the links you just put on the live comments here. One of those videos, I'm not sure which one it is, is of a, a doctor who um, performed I think he says thousands of abortions. And one of the most chilling moments in that video is when it's it's not even his description. His description is terrible, obviously, because he's describing in detail what takes place during an abortion. But then the video the video camera pans to the young women sitting in the room listening. And you as he's describing in detail what takes place, you just see the look of um horror at, at, at hearing the reality. And I think that there's that's a real thing that the church needs to be awakened to. Um, when we talk about abortion, sometimes it's it's it becomes so political, and we just think it's a right or a left wing thing. And it's like, wait a second, <laughs> every 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 issue that law dictates is an issue of morality, and the Bible speaks into every bit of morality. Therefore, every law the Bible speaks into, we cannot turn a blind eye a blind eye to evil. You can't. And it does no good to just try to say like, well, I don't want to look behind the curtain because I'd rather just be ignorant to it. That's passivity. That was Adam's mistake in the garden. He stayed passive while Satan attacked his wife, his bride. And uh, and we can't do that anymore. We've, we've been redeemed by Jesus Christ not to stay passive and not look behind the curtain. The more we know, the more helpful it is to make clear, cohesive, cogent arguments. And so watch those videos. I think they're helpful. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, um, after you watch the videos, after you, you, you come to grips with what abortion is and many of our listeners, many of our viewers, I mean, they're already there with us. Um, I put up a comment earlier from Elise's friend, Jana Hoy, who it was, it was, uh, you know, the hands raised kind of a, kind of a hallelujah, kind of a thank you for talking about this. And, um, and so many of the folks watching this, they're already on board and, and this is why it's so important for us to call out this this hypocrisy, because according to the hill.com, Rafe, Governor J.B. Pritzker on Friday filed an emergency rule. Now, this is this past Friday, I believe, an, an emergency rule that would penalize owners of restaurants, bars, gyms, barbershops and other businesses for reopening before coronavirus restrictions are lifted. Get this. In Illinois, a class A misdemeanor charge can carry a fine up to twenty five hundred dollars and a maximum jail sentence of a year for opening up your family bar or your family restaurant or your barber shop because you got to put food on the table, Rafe. So you can't feed your family and it's going to... I'm about to get fired up, man. I, you, I'm watching. You, you, you can't feed your family or it's going to be 2500 bucks and a year, possibly a year in jail. But don't worry. If you're an abortionist, business is fine. Business is good. In fact, business is booming if you're living in Waukegan. So this is this is the height of hypocrisy, man. Especially, look at the numbers. Look at the numbers here. Okay. Now, you and I have talked about how tragic, utterly tragic, coronavirus is. I'm not. I, I don't want to talk about it right now, Rafe. But we actually had a member of our church recently pass away, and it looks like it was coronavirus. Oh wow. I yeah, I don't know if you spoke to to Dan about that, but it's it's we're in a real period of mourning right now. It's so I. Uh, I'm I'm not compartmentalizing that away. I'm not um, in any way downplaying 
the mm. utter tragedy of that. Right. Uh, I'm sitting here with the weight. I mean, he was a friend. So it's, it, it, there's a burden on my soul as I talk about this, but which makes this all the more tragic. So according to a statistic from a few weeks ago, 3000 have died from COVID in Illinois. Now, again, we don't know if those numbers are inflated, deflated. There's been some issues with the counting of that. Regardless, that's the official number. According to the Illinois Department of Public Health, though, Rafe, in a three-month period, um, or, or if you take the annual um, number of abortions, and this is the, the statistic from, I believe, 2018, which is the most recent um, numbers I could get. If you take the, the annual abortion numbers in Illinois and you divide them by four, so we're now we're looking at a three-month period, which would, would correspond to January 15th to May 15th. Okay, we're looking at 14,147 babies aborted. So compare 3,000 coronavirus deaths with nearly five times as many deaths from abortion. If we can close the barbershop to mitigate the, the utter tragedy of COVID-19, we can sure wait to open up an abortion chamber that's going to lead, that's going to contribute to that number of 15,000 babies dead in, in three months. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's heartbreaking to hear. You know, what, what's, what's so fascinating about this, Joel, is that somehow, and it's not just somehow, this has been very intentional over a lot of years. Abortion has been deeply wound into the entire worldview that Pritzker is operating out of and that many people are operating out of. And I'm trying not to make this a party, like a, a political party conversation, uh, but it has become a central piece for both parties, for the right and the left. Um, but it, it's become so wound up into everything that it's it's a driving component. And that's why in the midst of a, of a COVID-19 shutdown, where you're shutting everything down, they're saying, but we got to keep this open because it's become that abortion has become that vital to seeing their worldview flourish, which is... Uh, if that is not a dark mark on a worldview, I don't know what is. To not be able to, to, to if we, I think we have to back up for a second and look at abortion just from a biblical lens. And I, want, I don't want to spend too long here, but I think if we're going to do worldview analysis, let's, let's start with the Bible. Let's build ourselves up because there might be some people here saying, wait a second, the Bible doesn't talk about abortion. Right, right. Let's do it. As a matter of fact, you can go to many secular websites or atheistic websites um, that will say, what does the Bible actually teach about abortion? And then what they'll say is the Bible is actually pro abortion right. or at least pro choice or at least silent on the issue. You and I both know that's not true. So um, when you, I'm, I'm, I, I've actually written um, a couple of, I've got an article and a podcast on this, so I'm pulling that up. But why don't you give us an introduction to, you know, where do you go in the Bible, Ray, Pastor Rafe, when you're, when you're looking for information on, you know, what is the Bible's teaching on right. you know, abortion, pro-life, pro-choice, et cetera? Well, there's a ton of places you can go in the Bible. So first of all, the Bible is fundamentally clear on the issue of what is taking place inside the mother of the womb. And one of the, the first starting places we begin, I, I'll go to three, I'll, and I'll try to keep this quick. Obviously, I preach a whole sermon on this. Um, but three quick places you can go to. In the Old Testament, uh, Psalm 139 is a great place. And beyond even the details of Psalm 139, what you get out of Psalm 139 is that the biblical worldview of a pregnant person, of a pregnant woman, is one of awe and wonder. Yep. Every Christian, every time, every time. And frankly, I don't know how anybody wouldn't be like this, even who's not a Christian. Every time you see a pregnant woman, you should look up to God and say, that's amazing. Totally. Amazing. How, how did you do that, Lord? Right, right. Like you make a baby. But then it goes into details and it starts talking about how God forms our inward parts. He knits us together in our mother's womb. Uh, verse 16 is actually really interesting. It says, your eyes saw my unformed substance. The Hebrew there is actually your eyes saw my embryo. It's the clo the closest English word we have to unformed substance. Really? In Hebrew is embryo. And it's saying, and, and, and the whole point of that verse is saying, you saw those days of my life, my embryonic days of my life. Right. It's affirming that th that's life. Those are part of your days. So real quick, I was talking with uh, my son this morning. We had to bring him into the, the hospital. My son, Lucas, if you don't know, um, he's had, uh, obviously, Rafe, I know you know, but for any of our listeners, he's had uh, health issues. And so I had to bring him into the hospital this morning. And um, we're talking about some of his earliest memories. You know what he tells me? 
Uh. He goes, I remember kicking mommy inside of her tummy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, Luke, there's no possible way. He goes, no, I do. I do. He's, he's talking about how he remembers. He's like, I remember my first day of karate, which was like six months ago. He's like, and I remember kicking mommy inside of her tummy. Yeah. So Rafe, I mean, there you go. He was, you know, he remembers it. No, I'm just, I'm well, you know what, was funny. to spin that into something that's really important. Uh, oftentimes the pro-abortion movement will say that one of the reasons it's not a life in the womb is because memories are not being formed. Um, brain uh, activity is not happening. It, there, the science is literally the opposite. And it's interesting watching uh, modern scientific journals. If you read on this topic, it, the, the journals don't, the doctors who write this like have to preface over and over again, we don't want this to be used in any way against abortion. But here are the facts of the matter. Right. And it'll state the facts. It's like babies form memories. Babies have emotions. Baby can recognize specific voices. Ba all these things that happen in the womb. And then they'll say it again. But don't use this in the abortion conversation. That's not why this is being printed. Right. All that to say, it's overwhelming. It's invaded every part of our, our, our sphere of life. So Psalm 139, great place to start. The other two places I'd go just real quick. Um, first of all, there's a great scene in the New Testament. And let me pull up the verse here. There's a whole bunch of places in the Old Testament you can go. But there's a great scene in the New Testament where um, Mary is pregnant with Jesus. And she goes up to uh, – and she visits uh, her cousin. And she, the cousin is pregnant with John the Baptist. And we're so told good. that John the Baptist leaps with joy in the womb at the, at when Jesus approaches. Now, here's the thing. John the Baptist – child in the womb, probably in the second trimester, as best as we can put together history, leaps with an emotion. An emo it's not just has a, a movement, like, like pregnant women feel movement, although that's important. Babies move. They actually have motion. That means the brain is functioning and mm -hmm. things are happening. But he experiences an emotion, and the Bible labels it that way. And his emotion is one of joy in the presence of his Savior, Jesus. Oh, such a powerful moment. Um, and so that, that's one piece. The baby experiences emotions. And we know that, right? The science backs that all up. Uh, what, what the, what the pro-abortion movement wants to say is there's no emotions taking place. But what science wants to say is actually the Bible was right all along. Right. Babies experience tons of emotions in the mm -hmm. womb. And in fact, one of the things that we know now is that a lot of times children that go through incredible distress, like when a mother's under incredible distress, what's going on to the child in the womb is actually causing some, um, some long-term harm, some things like it, it's causing work in the child that's going to have to be carefully nurtured through if the mother's going through intense stress during a pregnancy. Is that right? Wow. Yeah. Doesn't, doesn't surprise me. Um, but, uh, but you know, that's incredible to hear. Um, so Rafe, another, uh, those two passages were excellent. Thank you for that. We, another couple of passages that I like to go to would be, um, now I, Okay, here, let me let me go here first, then I'm going to swing back around. So first of all, Jeremiah 1.5, um, God is specifically talking to Jeremiah. He says, before I formed you in the womb, you know, I knew you. Um, and then he says, I called you to be a, a, a prophet. In other words, not only was Jeremiah known by God, the whole nine months or whatever, however long it was in his mother's womb, but God had a plan for his life. A plan for his life. <laughs> so So you got that going. Okay. Then um, I, I want to look at just two more real quick. Psalm 51. Let me see if I can find it. I got it right here. Okay. Psalm 51. Okay, good, good. Psalm 51, 5. Now check this out, man. You, this, is, this is a little unexpected. You might not expect this being an argument for uh, pro-life, but here's what it says. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Here's why I bring that up. Cause that doesn't, that's like, you know, you read that and you go, man, David didn't have a very high opinion of himself, you know, in the womb, but that is just the point here. David is David who wrote this Psalm. If you look at the background of it, this is right after he sinned. He, he murdered a guy, slept with his wife who is not pretty. Okay. But he's saying he's ascribing a continuation of being between the David who's writing the Psalm and the David who was in his mother's womb. Right. It's been, he didn't say, you know, uh, behold, uh, you know, I was, I mean, how would you even behold, um, the minute that I drew my first breath, I became a sinner or something like that. Or, or the minute I started to exist after I exited my mother's womb. I mean, just imagine, you know, the cumbersome language you'd have to use to even establish that. But he says, in sin, did my mother conceive 
me. Mm -hmm. There's a continuation, an unbroken continuation of being, an ontological connection between the David at the moment of conception and the David writing the psalm. Right. Can I go to one more verse here? Yeah, and I'll just add to that as a as an image bearer of God. It's image bearers of God. It's it's sinners, humans. That's are, right. Yes. And so he he's recognizing he has the quality of being a human in the eyes of God when yes. he was in his mother's womb. But, yes. Yeah. There's a moral status that he's applying to himself even in the womb, which is really fascinating because even though he he looks at it, he remembers himself, well, he doesn't remember, but he 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 hypothetically imagines himself in the womb talks about himself, says he was a sinner, and yet that does nothing to either break the continuation of being or to diminish in any way his dignity before God. So, right. you know, there there's something, there's a there's a perverted sense of, there's, a, there's something that the pro-abortion side is getting right, but they're twisting it. Here's what they're getting right. They're looking at this child in the womb and they're going, there's something wrong about this, okay? There's, we, we, we don't like something about this. But then they take a hard left turn and they go, uh, there's a, there is a moral status of this child in the womb. And that is that this child is a parasite. This child is stealing resources from its mother. This child doesn't deserve to live. We confer graciously and undeservingly the status of you know dignity upon this child. Okay, the biblical way of approaching it would be quite, the, quite different. It would say, yes, there is something wrong um, morally speaking about the child in the womb. And that is that like me and you and everybody, this child has a moral status that it is a child of Adam, Adam who rebelled against God. And right. this, this child who is, who is um, being formed in the womb is being formed in the womb by God, is being sustained by God. But um, this child will, as the child grows and develops that moral sense, this child will eventually need to repent of his or her sin and will need to trust in Jesus Christ to be fully restored back to God. And and that, but that doesn't take away any of its dignity, uh, any of its um, uh, status as an image bearer of God. It's still a precious human being. And as John Piper says, it is an example of the only, um, the only, new creation that will last forever that is made in the image of God, a new child. Right. It is a new creation brought into the world that will last forever that is made in the image of God. That is an unbelievably wow. weighty thing to realize. Yeah. Dude, um, I got I to gotta say one more thing. Exodus 21, verses 22 through 25. All right. This is the passage people go to and they say, ah, see, the, the Bible is not pro-life. Here's what it says. When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm. The one who hit her shall surely be fined as the woman's husband shall impose on him and he shall pay as the judges determine. So there's a recognition here that there's a harm being done both to the family and to the society. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Now, some people turn to that passage and they go, ah, see, it's talking about um, this woman has a miscarriage and that's sort of disregarded, but is the woman harmed? That's not what is actually being talked about here. If you go back and you know Hebrew, um, but my understanding is that when you actually look at the, the, the vocabulary and the grammar of this passage, it's saying... This is a premature birth. Mm -hmm. And the harm being assessed is harm not to the mother, but to the child who has been prematurely born. And so if there is harm, then the person who struck the mother shall be punished uh, accordingly, according to the, the husband who is sort of the legal representative of the family and the judge who is sort of, you know, the governmental representative. Um which, which makes this an incredibly pro-life passage, right? Because exactly. it's a pro-life passage. Okay, so go, so go, so go ahead. Talk about that. Well, no, no, I, I, I don't think we add add too much to that particular verse, other to say that uh, you're right. If you go on, you know, any place online, or you listen to someone trying to kind of hack the Bible together to make a point that the Bible doesn't say, they'll use they'll oftentimes go to that verse. 
Um, and it's totally wrong. The actual interpretation of that verse, it's a pro-life passage. It's revealing that God's law says something about what, when you cause harm to a child that was in the womb, there's a penalty for it. You're, you're, you're in trouble. When you, the, the life is considered a life that's in the womb. And so God's law in the Mosaic covenant. The, the last place I would go right now that's really important is, is to the life of Jesus, right? So <laughs> Jesus incarnated into Mary's womb, uh, he, he experienced the full from womb to tomb experience. Uh, he experienced everything of what it means to be human. He didn't start, he didn't, he didn't get, uh, he didn't in, uh, incarnate as an infant who was already born. He incarnated into the womb of Mary. And even just that, we, look, when we look to Jesus as Christians, we're, we, we look at his whole life and we understand something about what it meant for him to be both God, fully God, and fully man. To be fully man. He came in as an embryo in Mary's womb. It, it, I mean, sometimes I think the verse, when you go to like Psalms and stuff like that, you know, the proper exegesis of the Bible is exactly what we've been saying. But sometimes I think people try to discard it, try to discard it. And then when you get to Jesus, it's like, look, he was a, an embryo. He grew in his mother's womb. You know, and I think there's one other thing that's so important. So many things to talk about here. One of the arguments, when I preach on this, when I teach on this, one of the things I oftentimes hear people say is this. This is a movement, right? So so here we are, two men, Joel Sedekase and Rafe Chenery. This is a movement of men trying to control women. And I want to say a couple things to that. <clears throat> the, the, and they're saying the pro-life movement is a movement of men trying to control women. Let me say two things to that and make, be very clear on it. Number one, the majority of the pro-life movement in America, per surveys, statistics, and actual data, done across the nation last year is that the majority of people who are pro-life in America are women. That's right. So if we're going to actually make a statement about science, about data, what is this? This is a movement that is primarily led by women. Women are the ones who are on the lines more than men are. Women are the ones who are having these conversations more than men are. And if anything, I want to look every man who's watching this, who calls themselves a Christian to say, this, you need to get in this as well. It's not just for a few people to talk about this. It's for you if you're a Christian as well. And don't let the, the women be the ones taking the lead on this thing. Uh, right. You need to jump into the battle as well. Yeah. Um, I also want to say to that, that I, I understand where that comes from. One, if there's, if people don't know that, I get how they could think that. And I understand that there's a long history of abuse of women, both outside of the church and inside the church. My heart breaks for that. It really does. And there's a whole world to talk about on that, another show for another day. I understand where people could be hurt and, and begin to think that, but it's actually not true. What this is, is Christians, majority women in America, I wish it was majority men, but it's majority women in America looking at the Bible and saying something is wrong here. We're killing babies and we've legalized it and it's being done by the thousands and it's being disguised as medicine. And under any worldview, any, any worldview, that when you see that, when you see babies being killed, we should say enough. We have to see this changed. And it's the Christian worldview that provides the foundation and the basis for seeing this brought to an end. It's yeah. the Christian worldview that says that's a child. End of story. We're not joking around. This is serious. We're dealing with murder and we need to see it come to an end. So, Rafe, at some point in a future episode, because um, I think you and I both agree, we're going to talk about this again. This is not the last time. Oh, no. <laughs> not until they not until they end it, man. Not until they end it. And then we'll keep talking about about how we let this go on for as long as we did in this country. So that we never forget. Yeah. So um, I want to put up a quick comment. But before I do, um, there is um, – there. Th let me just say this. There are a number of objections that I really would like us to address that we need to talk about in a future episode. Um, what about the life of the mother? What about in cases of rape, incest, things like that? Um, what about the objection that says when you outlaw abortions, they actually increase, and when you make them legal, they, the number actually goes down? I don't think we have time to talk about them right now, nor do I think that we're probably prepared to answer those other than just shooting from the hip. Um, but, but for those of you watching, those of you listening, keep staying tuned. You know, like this page, subscribe on YouTube because 
we are going to come back to these issues on a future Worldview Wednesday podcast. Um, rest assured for that. But let me pull up this um, comment. This is from Mark Zanders. Um, here's what he says. It's just crazy to me how the Democratic Party went from abortion being, quote, safe, legal, and rare, end quote, still evil, 15 to 20 years ago, to, quote, shout your abortion, end quote, today. It's just heartbreaking. Okay, Rafe, we do not need to, we don't, we're not here to puff up the Republican Party or the Libertarians or the Constitution Party, and we're not here to run roughshod over the Democratic Party. But what I would like us to do, and, and I, think, I think we both agree we need to go here, is if this is the state of our public discourse, where, where literally there are folks out there, and I'm not saying it's every Democrat either, and I don't think Mark would say that it's every Democrat, but there are people who are becoming more in your face with their abortions. Okay, there's, there's TikTok videos where people are making light about abortion, things like that. What are some next steps for Christians, practical next steps, who believe the biblical worldview, who recognize the hypocrisy of, of, of uh, a governor like Governor Pritzker or uh, Governor Northam in Virginia um, or governor, um, the governor of Michigan, Whitmer? What are some next steps for us to take? And, and how about this? Let's make it personal. What are some steps that you and I on a personal level are taking? Yeah, well, let's let's start with a real clear one, um, because and, and I think this is really important for everybody to hear and any Christian who's part of another church uh, besides the one that Joel and I are part of where I'm a pastor of. Uh, I, I want you to hear this with clarity. This is one of the best things you can do. And I think it speaks so much. Um, oftentimes, the non-Christian world, when they look at on Christians saying, look, we're, we're not for abortion, what they say is, yeah, you just like talking about it. But what are you going to do about it? And let me tell you what we did about it. At our church, what we've done is we've created an adoption fund. Adoptions are expensive, but adoptions are an alternative to an, to an abortion. When a woman finds herself with an unplanned pregnancy, when you as a Christian go up to them, and there are amazing organizations, we'll mention a few at the end of the show, that care for women with a biblical love, just the way Jesus loves on sinners, right? It, it go, go, go for, just loves on people. And it goes up and offers them and points them towards places where they can get, they can give their child up for adoption. Adoption is a safe way to protect life, to not fall into sin, and to actually see that child raised up in a home where they'll be loved and nurtured and taken care of. At our church, we create an adoption fund, and we're seeing adoptions take place across the church. And we're a fairly large church in Chicago, and we're talking about and lots of people beginning to have the conversation of actually taking steps to becoming an adoptive parent. What I would love to say to Christians watching, if you're not a part of this, our church in Chicago and you're a part of another church, encourage your church to do the same. Creating an adoption fund and mobilizing your people for adoption. I'm an adoptive parent of two. I've adopted two children from Chicago. I love my daughters dearly. They are my daughters. Um, and, I, and I want to encourage this is, a, this is something Christians should be considering stepping into. A little history here. Just one minute here, Joel. If you go back to Roman history, and I love talking about this, when you go back to Roman history, there was a time in Roman history when the Romans practiced what was called infant exposure. The it was a form of abortion. You, you give birth to a child you didn't want, and if it was, you know, if it had a deformity or if it had something you didn't like, maybe it was a gender you didn't like, maybe it was just an unplanned pregnancy. You could just leave it and expose the baby to the elements and just leave it on the sidewalk or in a particular place where there was like a garbage dump. Now that's saying that sounds terrible to our modern ears, the way abortion should sound terrible to our modern ears, but it sounds terrible that people would even consider that in the old days. How gruesome. The way that ended was Christians with their Bible open saying, that's not right. Let's adopt those children. And an entire generation of Christians stepped into adoption and they started bringing kids in their home, two, Let's three, go. four kids. And soon enough, even the pagans were looking in on the Christians saying, they love our people better than we love our people. Right, right. And then they became Christians because of it. Dude. That history, that's actually the history of the world. And we are at that place again. It's a, This is the day for Christians to adopt, to yeah. step in, and end abortion. That's how it works. Dude, hasn't it always been that way? That um, and, and as a matter of fact, this isn't just true about conservative Christians, but conservative-leaning religions in general. And I'm not being a 
pluralist or relativist here, you know me, Rafe. But okay. the more conservative your religion is, the more likely you are to value children and to have more kids. And um, and this has always been true about Christians through the ages. So you want to talk about how did the early church win the Roman Empire? Okay, there were a lot of factors. There were invasions. There were political moves. But good grief, man. How about this for a strategy? Uh, the Romans, pagans don't want their kids. Fine, we'll take them. And guess what? We're going to raise them as Christians. Right. We're going to bring them down to, you know, um, Ephesus Christian Academy and uh, or, or uh, Antioch uh, homeschooling co-op. And we're going to raise them as as uh, Christian kids and in, in a classical Christian co-op, which classical was for them. That was, you know, that was like the, the contemporary stuff. Right. That was like the cutting edge because yeah. it was 2000 years ago. Uh -huh. But but it's like, man, that's a way to win. That's a good way to win. That's a good strategy right there. I love yeah, that. You're not just saving the baby. You're saving you're, you're, you're giving an incredible testimony of the love yes. of Jesus Christ to someone else. Don't forget, Christian, you've been adopted. Your heavenly father adopted mm. you Amen. to the saving gospel of Jesus Christ when he purchased you on the cross. He paid the fine to purchase you and bring you into his family. And so you're literally just paying it forward when you step into that. Not every family is called to adoption. I totally get that. Yeah. I know that. But this is something that many families are called to. And I think many churches need to step up and really push this across our country. Love it. All right. Um, so working with the local church, starting an, an adoption fund. Um Rafe, we, we did have a question come in. We have to address it at the end. It's okay. A really, really good question. Put it up. Let's do it. Okay. And then, then I want to, here, wait, let's, let's finish our next steps first. Okay. Let's finish our next steps because I want to, I want to just, I want to make sure we mention these. Mm -hmm. What about, what about starting a ministry with your church to go down to the local abortion mill and, uh, and, and pray and within the legal parameters of what's allowed operating in public spaces, not violating any no noise ordinances and, and extending love and care out of generosity, yeah. out of spirit infused love. Yep. Going down and, and advocating and, and offering help yep. to women and their husbands, boyfriends, significant others, moms, dads, whoever's escorting them. Yep. Offering that care at the abortion mill. Is that something you you would advocate for? Oh yeah, and we'll be doing a lot of that, Lord willing, this summer. Uh, what's the movie that was it called? Unplanned was mm -hmm. it the movie that came out a while ago? Mm -hmm. Watch that movie. Um, that that movie is really worth watching. The abortion industry was terrified of that movie, uh, and uh, Christians, every Christian, should watch it to get a good sense of it. it's. It's a movie that kind of walks you into the abortion industry and how it works. Um, but in that movie, they make a statement that they talk about when there are people praying outside an abortion clinic. It's a startling percentage of women who come up to the clinic do not go through with their abortion. It's like over 50 percent of the abortions don't take place just when there's people there who are praying. The, the, the visible there, there's someone here praying for this actually saves children's lives. And so, uh, yes. And, and I would even you know, I would back up for just a moment. I think for a lot of folks. One of the first steps you can take, you know, I, I think you, you hear the conversation on abortion and perhaps, you know, at, at some point in my Christian journey, and I would even say when I was first a pastor, I would have held this this position, uh, is that it's just not my space to be in. What I would love to just encourage you to do is to really begin to pray. Pray for a softened heart, wherever you are, whatever your position on this is, whatever, whatever your, your fire in your belly over this is, whether you think this is something you keep at arm's length, whatever. As a Christian, will you start praying about this? Pray for an end to it. Do you know how powerful prayer is? It's our greatest weapon, Ephesians 6. That's our great weapon we have against the work of the enemy is prayer. And so pray, foster that in your heart, a life of prayer, listening to the spirit, and then watch how the Lord stirs in you. And bold action comes out of a life of prayer. That's that's how bold, courageous action, bold action. If, if it's not rooted in an identity level life of prayer, it's going to be very hard to sustain in a meaningful way. It's going to fall apart at the first second of persecution, right? It's a seed scattered on uh, you know rocky soil. You need to have an identity that's built up and empowered by the Spirit, and that's formed in prayer. So please pray. That's a good starting point for many people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so ministering outside an abortion mill and, and, or praying about what your role should be, um, working with, um, crisis pregnancy centers yes. is, is I think another great way to get involved. Uh, when my family and I lived out in the Western suburbs, we, um, we 
supported, there was a local crisis pregnancy center out there based out of Joliet that was just doing some incredible work, incredible. And every year we would go to the banquet and, you know, the banquet's so wonderful. You hear the, the, the amazing stories of babies who were saved. You get the calendar and then they do their, their ask and everybody there is there to support. Everybody's there is there to, um, to, you know, uh, to, to fund it in some way. So everybody gets out their checkbooks and it's like, you just look around and you're like, man, there's hundreds of people here and we're all joined. I might not be serving, although I highly recommend reaching out to your local crisis pregnancy center and volunteering. A lot of times you can do that through the website. Yeah. Um, but just write a check, sign up on the website for, for five bucks a month, dip your toe in the water, yep. see, see if God blesses that. And, and you know what? He's going to bless it. I, it. It's a blessing in and of itself because you know that abortion is wrong. And these crisis pregnancy centers are doing some amazing, amazing work. Ultrasounds, um, pregnancy tests, uh, counseling, pre and post-abortive counseling. Mm-hmm. Faith. You want to talk about love and yeah. grace? How many women, how many moms re- regret their abortion? You can go to one of these centers and right. get counseling afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, and that that's the kind of love that the Christian church needs to be known for. It's not just a it's not just a transactional love. It's not just, oh, I go out and then I go home. No, we're relational people. We 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 serve people in a over the long period of their life, and a woman who chooses to keep her baby needs to be loved, needs to be brought into a church community, cared for, experience overwhelming grace and compassion in the community of saints and uh, that changed person's life. Yeah. Um I I put up on the banner here there's an organization in Chicago called Caris, which they've got locations in the Chicago Loop and then one up in, um, I think, South Barrington. It's out of the Willow Creek, like the big Willow Creek mega campus up there. Um, but uh, that's an excellent organization. My wife and I are supporting them. Uh, yeah. But there's another organization that we're also supporting, which is which is called End Abortion Now. And uh, this is an organization that is very gospel-centered, very unashamed in their gospel witness Mm -hmm. in their in their approach to abortion from a biblical worldview Uh, you've you've got to be familiar with them right because you know jeff durbin and of course of course yeah have you guys done anything with them yet you know i haven't i haven't and one of the things with end abortion now and and uh they have a very very direct approach to this you know when you talk about having pictures of the of the babies and all that kind of thing and not everyone will be comfortable with that approach but in terms of having a vision to see abortion ended um, wow, they really, I'd say they've, they've done a very good job of developing a system to mobilize churches to step in and be, be the church and step into brokenness like this in a way that is full of care and compassion and love. And so I think that they've done a good job. It's a, it's a, it's a good organization. Yeah. And another thing that they do is uh, they actually offer resources to help you get prepared to go and speak to your local legislators, your local magistrates, uh, your city council. And, uh, Rafe, I'd be real surprised if that wasn't in our future, man. <laughs> uh, because I know where, where your motivation lies. I know where your passion is on this issue. And, um, I, I actually, you know something, I wanted to show this video. This video actually left me in tears. And Elisa earlier, uh, do you, are you good on time? Do you, do you have a couple minutes to yeah, work? Yeah, it's like three minutes long. Go do it. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show, I'm going to share this, um, this uh, video, it's called, if you look it up on YouTube, it's called Kid Boldly Confronts City Council. And I'm telling you what, man, it literally left me in tears. Let's let's pull it up here. Okay. This is from End Abortion Now. No audio, Joel. Ah, okay. Sorry, one second. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to remove that. And I need to um, I need to add the uh, the audio. That's my problem. So here we go. Okay, we should be good now. L- less than three minutes long. Hi, my name is Mikey. I strive to love Jesus each and every day. I've been paying attention at the means I've attended, and I've noticed a few things. Number one, city council meetings are very long. Number two, when you guys are saying yes to something, you're actually saying no to something else. 
I'm here to ask you today to change your mind on abortion. Instead of saying yes to Planned Parenthood and no to babies, you can easily say yes to babies and no to Planned Parenthood. When you're saying no to Planned Parenthood, you're saying no to murder. That seems to make more sense than saying yes to murder. I've heard many of you justify your reason for saying yes to a proposal during these meetings. How do you justify saying yes to murdering a baby? Mayor Gago, I don't understand. You had a baby. Knowing that abortions end the life of human beings, how do you say yes and yes and smile and take pictures of others who say yes too? I know I'm just a kid, but that is exactly my point. These babies are kids just like me. Were you ever a kid? How long were you in your mother's womb? My mom was only seven months pregnant when I was born. In many states, my mom could have had the doctor rip my arms off and squish my head at 34 weeks. Since you know I was still a parasite and all. That's crazy for me to think about. Funny thing is, I'm nine years old and you could still call me a parasite. I can't survive without my mom and dad. I need their, I need their money. I need their help. I need them to give me food and shelter. I need their love or I would die. Would any of you feel comfortable allowing a doctor to rip off my legs or inject me with poison right here and right now? Please tell me you can see I'm a human being. The same human being that left my mother's womb many weeks before my due date. Is it okay to kill somebody because of their location? Does 20 feet or 6 inches decide who lives and who dies? My mother's womb is sitting right there. Is it level of development? Age? What standard are you using? Don't you see that all these arguments are silly when you're talking about life of a unique person? Abortion is murder. A human is being... A human being... A baby is a human being and abortion is murder. Even kids know that. One of the things that uh, sorry, I'll wait till I'll wait till we get back. Here we go. One of the things about that video uh, you heard when the the kid was done the clapping. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that church I know that church and one of the things that church has done a really good job of of is they <laughs> they go to every city council meeting, every council meeting, and they step in and they speak and they request and they're consistent and they're. Long, they're long suffering and they, they keep up the work and you hear that was their church that was applauding that, that little guy. Um, what a testimony. That was powerful. Thanks for sharing Nine that, years Joel. old, man. Nine, Nine years, years old. old. So if he can do it, if he can do it, mm -hmm. if he can do it at nine years old, good grief, man. Yeah. What the heck are we doing? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> All right. Um, that's encouraging to me. I, I hope it, uh, I hope it was to, to others. I just wanted to share that. Um, so Rafe in the future, we need to talk about those objections. We need to talk about how to contact your local representatives. Um, you can go to, there's, there's an easy website, illinoispolicy.org slash maps, um, which you, you can, you can find your, your alderman, your, um, your, uh, state representative, your state Senator. But, um, the point is, you know, move in the right direction. Mm. And, um, you know, the world's always going to be filled with Governor Pritzker's that, I mean, the world had Pontius Pilate's, you mm -hmm. know, in Jesus day. And, uh, there, there's always been Pilate's and Herod's and Caesar's and Pritzker's and, um, and Northam's. But the world did not have democracy like America in Amen. Jesus's day. And that's that right. is something that we need to steward well. Amen. And I think that's a, I think that's something that we really, as modern day Christians need to steward well, that there's an opportunity uh, to utilize legal means to see change in our country. And that happens through the way we vote. That happens through the way we use all the, the resources and tools that the the modern world, <laughs> through many Christians who helped form the modern world, gave us. Uh, they, they, and so uh, that, that's something we get to steward. And we need to do that well. All right. So last question before we wrap up here. Ilgen Cho asks this. He says, I don't know if this was oh, asked wow. yet. Should Christians ever vote for candidates who support abortion. Your thoughts? 
Yeah, let, let me, here's how I would answer that. I'm going to answer for me personally, just so you get my, my, where I'm coming from. Um, I'm very, when I, when I, uh, I, I will never as a pastor get out there and say, vote Republican, vote Democrat. That's not what I'm trying to do. Um, I think there's uh, major pitfalls in both of the party's platforms. Neither of them is a perfect representation of Christ. And yet, uh, at the end of the day, real voting has to take place, right? You, you got to choose somebody. What I would say is so long as, there, as there's a party that, built into the fabric of how they, uh, their, their whole doctrine, uh, abortion is woven into that as something that's celebrated and to keep pushing, which is the current democratic, pla democratic platform. It's unvotable for me. That doesn't mean, and sometimes when I say that, I hear people say, yeah, but, uh, Republicans don't care for people outside of the womb. And I would say that I, it's actually not true. There's two different approaches for how to care for people outside of the womb. And it's, it's not that one doesn't care and one does care. It's what is the best approach to care. And that's something we can debate on. Man, I love that debate. Let's try to figure that. Christians should be very concerned about how to care rightly for people outside of the womb. Yes and amen. Let's have that dialogue. But there is a big difference on how we treat people inside the womb. And right now, there's an entire party whose platform is built on aborting children. And they are going to push that very hard. And so long as that's the case, it's unvotable for me. I couldn't put my name to it. Now, I know that people will disagree with that. But I'm just telling you, that's how I think of the matter. Uh, and that's I'll leave it at that. I could I'll, if I keep talking, I'll put my foot in my mouth. But that's yeah. where that's how I uh, that's how I think through that. You know, same here as a representative of Crew, which is our parent organization. I don't I don't even think I'm allowed to endorse political candidates or anything like that. So you're not going to hear me do that. But um, but I would say, as a Christian, you have your Bible. You you have what the Bible says. Uh, you have a, a framework for understanding what's moral and what's not. And look, this isn't biblical, but Aristotle, I pulled this book out, I pulled this book out more and more lately in his Nicomachean Ethics. He says the political science is the study of what is the greatest good for humanity. And if we're going to take that definition to the political sphere of our world, then answering political questions is answering questions about what is morally right, what leads to human flourishing. And as Christians, what is going to bring our society most in line with the good design God has for the world, for society, for government, which he instituted, for the family, which he instituted, and which is going to allow the church the most freedom to flourish and allow the individual to self-govern, which is the foundation of all other government, which I think, Rafe, you pointed that out to me last time. So, um, yeah, I look at a question like this, and Rafe, I am right there with you. Abortion is a non-starter for me. Now, if we had two parties that were um, pro-abortion, as there are in, in many Western nations, that's probably a different conversation. And then, and then I might my calculus might change. I might vote for neither party, which I still, you know, that's still a live option today, of course. Mm -hmm. Or um, I might do what the late Ravi Zacharias, who, God rest his soul, man, there's, we got to do a tribute to him. Yeah, we do. Um, but I remember a talk that he gave in 2012 at Trinity International University, where I was a student. Um, in, in the grad school at the seminary there, he said, um, look for the candidate that's going to provide the best soil for freedom and liberty and religious religious freedom to, uh, to thrive. Mm. And so there's something to think about. Um, I think that's a biblical injunction. Can't get into the, the full reason why right now, but there's a lot to think through. And uh, Rafe, I'm glad you mentioned the point about democracy because the fact is our government, to a certain extent, is in our hands. And that means government policy, like whether abortion is allowable or non-allowable, um, lawful or, or illegal. These are questions that, that are in our hands. We can't sit back passively and say, well, I didn't know, or it was out of my hands. Um, and I'm just going to, I just want to read um, Proverbs 24, 11, which says this, uh, 10, 10 through 12. It says this, if you faint in the day of distress, how small is your strength. Rescue those being led away to death and restrain those stumbling toward the slaughter. If you say, behold, we did not know about this. Does not he who weighs hearts consider it? Does not the one who guards your life know? Will he not repay a man according to his deeds? I don't know that we even need to comment on that, Rafe. Mm. Yeah. All right. Any closing thoughts, my brother? 
No, thank you for this conversation, Joel. I, thank I, you. I, we've, we, this is a conversation you and I have had in private many times mm -hmm. and in many other forums. You and I, we, we talk about this stuff all the time, but to get a chance to really engage and hear some of these questions, see some of the questions that are coming in and, mm -hmm. uh, and know that we have this platform to keep this conversation alive. There's so much work still to do. And so just grateful to get the conversation going. Absolutely. Um, to get more excellent content from Pastor Rafe, just go to Rafe Chenery, R-A-E-F-C-H-E-N-E-R-Y. Dot com. That's where you can find his pastoral blog. Lots of great content on there. Also, can I just put a quick plug in? Follow Rafe on Twitter. If you're not doing that, he's been spitting some fire lately. Some really good stuff. <laughs> Check that out. Follow him on there. While you're at it, might as well engage with the Think Institute as well. Go to twitter.com forward slash Think Inst, I-N-S-T, or connect with us on Facebook or the Instagram. We are at the Think Institute. Follow our blog and website. Go to thethink.institute. And if you haven't done so yet, please like our YouTube channel. Subscribe to us on there. No, subscribe on YouTube. Like and uh, follow us on Facebook. Um, I think that's about it. So uh, this isn't goodbye. This is this has just been a little pit stop along the way of your spiritual journey. I sure hope, and I know Rafe hopes, that you've heard something that's useful for you, a next step that you can put into practice to put your faith in action and fulfill your piece of the Great Commission this week. That's about all we have for you. So until next time, hold on. Oh, now wait a second. Wait just a minute. Until next time. Better make sure I share this audio. All right, hold on, hold your horses. Until next time. Can you hear that? No. I can't hear that either. <laughs> You'll get it. Oh, I wait can a minute. see wait it, though. Minute. There it there is. There you go. There it is. All right. Until next time, we sure hope it made you think. <laughs>